We're going to be an account today that seems somewhat unusual to our culture, but really has very normal elements in the day in which Jesus lived. Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50, deals with an account of a woman's overflowing gratitude to Jesus by anointing his feet and wiping it with her hair. We have another account of that in the other three Gospels, but I really think a different lady. In the other Gospels, in Mark 14, 3 through 9, Matthew 26, 6 through 13, and John 12, 2 through 8, is the story of Lazarus' sister, Mary, anointing Jesus' feet uh, in Bethany. Here in Luke 7, we have apparently a prostitute doing the very same thing. To identify these two women is unfair to Mary uh, of Bethany. The accounts are very similar but have unique differences. It is obvious to me that we're dealing with the same theme here that we're dealing with in the parable of the Pharisee and the sinner. We're dealing with self-righteousness and we're dealing with a humble, contrite heart. And that's the whole account here is about how people come to Jesus and how they view themselves. I think it is also significant to remember that Jesus was willing to minister to all groups. We're going to find him here eating at a Pharisee's home. He was as willing to eat with a sinner as he was willing to eat with a Pharisee. Jesus knew no barriers between Zacchaeus, Matthew, and a self-righteous Pharisee. He was willing to meet all men's need and to teach all men. Now, let's look then, it says, now one of the Pharisees, and we learned in verse 40, his name is Simon. Now, basically what we have in this Pharisee, and I want to do a little historical uh, background if I could. The etymology of the term Pharisee is somewhat disputed. Some think it means separated one, but we're not certain on that. They seem to have developed during the Maccabean period. During this period, the Syrians tried to Hellenize the Jews by forcing them to eat pork, to give up the Mosaic law. Uh, they even put a statue of Zeus in the temple. Uh, a, man, a priest from Moden revolted. His sons, known as the Maccabees, and in particular Judas Maccabeus, the hammer, uh, was successful in overthrowing the Syrian domination. In the Jewish uh, calendar, this is known as the Festival of Lights. It's what, around Christmas time for us. And it is a celebration of the re-cleansing uh, of the temple in Jerusalem. During this whole period, apparently a group of separated ones, or those committed to the law, begin to develop. They are different from the Sadducees because the Pharisees were more the liberals. The Sadducees only accepted the Mosaic tradition. But the Pharisees accept, accepted all of the oral tradition we know as the Talmud and the Mosaic legislation. The Pharisees believed in a developed angelology. They believed in life or death. And uh, Paul was a Pharisee. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Joseph Arimathea was a Pharisee. Uh, most of the time in the New Testament, they come off rather legalistic, although not always. This particular man uh, does not seem to be a legalist, but he is very confident in his own ability to approach God. Now, notice it says he invited him to take dinner. Luke is always recording Jesus eating with people, especially Pharisees. You ought to see chapter 11, verse 37, and chapter 14, 1. Now, so it says, so he came to the Pharisee's home and took his place at the table. Now, we must remember that the table we're talking about is not like our day. Uh, the traditional picture of the Lord's Supper by Michelangelo is just inappropriate. They had low tables with large pillows and apparently they reclined on their left elbow and, and ate with their right hand. Now there is some uh, disagreement on this because reclining to eat is basically Greco-Roman although it seems to imply what they did in the New Testament because the word is they reclined at meal. Now, it continues here, then what it says in verse 37, and look, there was a woman in the town who was a social outcast. Now, we're not sure she was a prostitute. Maybe she was notorious for breaking the oral tradition in some way. But everybody in town knew her as a woman that they considered to be morally and ceremonially unclean. It was inappropriate to have any social contact with her at all. Now, the question is, had she ever get into a Pharisee's house? 
the very fact that she came to such a situation is, is uh, marvelous and unusual in itself. You see, we're so used to having people over and we close the front door and sit down with them and talk, but it, totally different in the New Testament time. There would be a large dinner and people would be invited to eat around the table. Then anyone in the town who wanted to could come in and sit along the walls, even participate in the conversation and be welcome in that home. So apparently in the large crowd that was not eating around the table, but was sitting around the walls, this woman came in, apparently unnoticed at first. And notice what she did. It says, and when she learned, this is a very strong word in Greek, it means to learn experientially or know experientially, that he was taking dinner, reclining at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster bottle of perfume. Now this alabaster, it gets that name from the town in Egypt where a large amount of this of soft stone came from. It was either yellowish or whitish. Uh, usually the bottles were, were so big, they had a large, bell, uh, a large bowl-shaped bottom and came to a little thin neck. Usually when they were opened once, they could not be resealed. Uh, women were so proud of the perf perfume like this that many of this wore them around their neck and the rabbis even allowed them to wear them on the Sabbath. Many of these was a marriage diary. Uh, this lady had one of these little jars, maybe around her neck, but it was a prized possession. It was probably more money than she would ever see in all of her life. And so she had one of these little jars, a bottle of perfume, and she took her stand beside his feet. Now, if you think me for a moment, if Jesus was sitting under a table, she would have to crawl under the legs of the guests to get to his feet. But if he was reclining on his left elbow, his feet would be out behind him and would uh, be accessible to this lady, okay? She got behind him at his feet and was continually weeping. And she began to wet his feet with her tears, but she continued in perfect tense to wipe them off with the hair of her head. This sign of, of tears and weeping over someone's feet is not an unknown social event. We have a couple of accounts in the Talmud of this being done to very noted rabbis uh, by women who were so appreciative of their teaching and their ministry as rabbis. I'm sure this, this woman quietly weeping, Jesus obviously knew what was happening because of the tears falling on his feet. Here we have a symbol of broken heartedness. Uh, I'm sure that Jesus had already dealt with her, that she had probably already met him, that he had already dealt with her in a personal way, and she just wants to show how thankful she is that someone took the time to care about her, to deal with her, to minister to her. Oh, I wonder, friends, is there anybody that you refuse to minister to? Jesus wouldn't be in our fancy, beautiful churches. He'd be out in the highways and byways of our world ministering to people who everyone else thought was insignificant, everybody else thought was unworthy of their time. That's the folks Jesus ministered to, and that's why they loved him so. And here's this lady wiping it off with her hair. It was, it was considered to be socially unacceptable for a woman to let down her hair in public. This woman forgot where she was. She forgot all appropriateness in this sign of uh, love expressed toward Jesus. And she kept right on kissing his feet with affection. Imperfect tense just kept right on doing it. I'm sure that was somewhat uncomfortable for everybody who was there, uh, probably uh, including Jesus. And anointing them with the perfume. That's anointing means over and over. She would cry a while. She would wipe with her hair. She would kiss his feet and pour a little perfume. And I'm sure the smell of that very fragrant perfume filled the whole house uh, with that beautiful aroma, everybody realized what was happening. Whether they saw it, whether they heard her kissing, whether they smelled the perfume, everybody's eyes is glued on this lady's inappropriate, seemingly, social actions. Now, everybody knew who she was. So when the Pharisees who invited him saw it, he said to himself, if you are really a prophet. Now, this is a second-class sentence. The meaning for this in Greek grammar is the Pharisee was saying to himself, I don't think you really are a prophet, and I don't think you really know who this lady is. And so he puts it in a second-class conditional. If you really were a prophet, you would know uh, who and what character the woman is who is clinging to him uh, that she is a social outcast. And notice apparently he is talking to himself, not to Jesus verbally. And then Jesus says, answered him, Simon. Now Jesus is going to really read people's thoughts. Sometimes it's hard to know if he was a good judge of character 
and when he is simply using his deity to read people's minds. And I think both are found on the page of the New Testament. Now he calls this man by his name. This man's name is Simon. Now Simon is a very common name. In the other accounts of the woman uh, washing Jesus' feet and anointing him, it was Simon the leper, not Simon the Pharisee. Now I want to give you just a quick rundown of, all of the many Simons mentioned in the New Testament. Simon Peter, and that will be Matthew 4, 18. Simon the Canaanite, known as the Zealot, one of the apostles, Matthew 10, 4, Acts 1, 13. Simon, Jesus' half-brother, Matthew 13, 55. Simon the leper, Matthew 26, 6. Simon of Cyrene, who carried Jesus' cross, Matthew 27, 32. Simon the Pharisee, here in this text, Luke 7, 36 and 40. Uh, Simon, the father of Judas Iscariot, John 6, uh, 31, excuse me, 71. Uh, Simon Magnus, the magician, Acts 8, 9, and Simon the Tanner, in whose home Peter stayed, Acts 9, 43. So you recognize how common it'd be like Bob or John or something like that in our day, a very common name. Uh, I have something to say to you, Jesus said. He said, Rabbi, go on and say it. He wasn't real interested, but he would listen if the teacher spoke. Two men were in debt to a money lender. One owed him a hundred dollars and another ten. Now my Williams translation always interprets the monetary value of Greek and Roman coins into uh, our money. I think that's very unfortunate because we lose some of the meaning of these uh, terms because of the day in which we live. The time here is fifty denarii and five hundred denarii. Now a denarii is what a Roman soldier would earn in one day. It is what a day laborer would earn in one day. So if we could put it in our day, how much do you make in a day? Well, that's about how much one of those would be. Multiply it times 50 for one and 500 for the other. And you can see kind of the monetary equivalent in our day. Now, uh, they owed him that much money. And since they could not pay him, he graciously canceled their debts for both of them. Now, which one will love him more? And Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled most. Again, you see the I suppose shows how indifferent Simon is to, to really be talking to Jesus. Then he said, you are correct in your judgment. And turning face to face to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came to your house and you did not give me water for my feet. You did not kiss me. And you did not anoint my head with oil. Verse 44, 45, 46. Now these were normal social customs in that day that Simon had neglected to do. Now why he neglected to do them, we're not told. Uh, a, a cultural equivalent in our day would be if someone rang your doorbell, a friend, you would invite them in the house. You would probably offer them a seat. You would offer them something to drink. Now, what would you think if one of your best friends came to eat and you made them stand on the porch and talk to them out there? It was as a rude a treatment that Simon did to Jesus as, as we would of not inviting someone in our home or having them stand instead of sit. So it was, it was a very obvious social affront. Now, the idea about washing the feet, and you know that from Jesus doing it in uh, John 13. The people wore sandals. And walking on the dusty roads of Palestine, their feet become very dirty. So they could be very clean, but their feet would be dirty. And so they would, uh, someone, usually a slave or a servant, would take off the shoes and wash them in a basin of water and dry them off. Now the kiss here is something that if you've ever watched Frenchmen greet each other, Russians greet each other, Arabs greet each other, sometimes they kiss on one cheek and sometimes they kiss on both cheeks. This was the cultural setting. We see it in the early church many times. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Well, that's where the early church would kiss on one cheek or the other cheek. It came to be a real problem in the church and was later dropped because of its abuse. They just had men kissing men and women kissing women. That doesn't sound real thrilling to me. But anyway, Simon did not kiss Jesus. Now, anointing of the head. We're talking about, uh, I don't know if you ever have been to Europe. Uh, or on a, a, a European plane. I was real surprised in, in flying to Norway and to Israel uh, several years ago that in the restroom is a little bottle of perfume. 
and you're expected after going to the bathroom to use this little uh, bottle of perfume. Uh, a friend of mine told me on a bus riding through Europe, before the bus would leave the bus station, the driver would go down and give everybody on this unair conditioned bus a little perfume. <laughs> it's a pretty good idea. Well, that's the kind of social custom in coming into a person's house Olive oil was a sign of festival gladness. And so they would give someone a little olive oil to put on their face. It would make their face glisten. Uh, we would call it party clothes would be as close as I can get to it. He didn't give him any olive oil for his head or his hair. Um, now, but she's anointed my feet with perfume. Instead of olive oil, we have this very expensive perfume. Um, and it shows how she wiped his feet with her hair and, and she kissed him on the feet and showing how, how the attitude she had compared to the attitude of Simon. Now, down in verse 47, Therefore I tell you, her sins, as many as they are. Now I want you to know, Jesus didn't overlook her sins. He recognizes and publicly acknowledges this is a, a lady who has major problems in her life. He's not saying your sins don't make any difference. He's saying, though her sins be many, they are forgiven. This is a perfect tense verbal form. Now, perfect tense in Greek means an action that happens in the past with results that abide into a state of being. Her sins are forgiven, they remain forgiven, is what he's saying. Now, why would Jesus do this? Jesus needed to shake up the theology of the Pharisees enough for them to realistically evaluate his claims about himself and about God. And one of the ways Jesus did this was to startle them, either by healing on the Sabbath or eating on the Sabbath or, or doing something they thought was inappropriate or on making claims for himself that they were absolutely astonished by. No one can forgive sins but God. And that's exactly why Jesus do it. Back in chapter 5 of Luke, we have the man who was let down through the roof. Remember that account? When he forgave that man's sins, all the Pharisees in the room begin to say, oh, no one can do this but God. Jesus is doing the very same thing. Now what he's doing is, He's taking a situation where this uh, very sinful but very repentant woman is treating him with great dignity and affection. And he's using this opportunity to strike at the heart of Pharisaic self-righteousness. They thought they were right with God by the abundance of things that they did not do or the abundance of rules that they did do. And Jesus is trying to show that the relationship with God is based not on a man's outward acts, but on a man's heart. It was not the fact this woman was washing his feet or kissing his feet that made her right with God. It was her heart attitude expressed toward Jesus that's the basis of her relationship that's going to issue an eternal salvation, while Simon's, though outwardly very religious and very moral, has a heart attitude that's going to issue in lostness. And we need to hear that. Now, so, but the one who has, has, uh, who has little to be forgiven loves me little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Perfect tense. Another real shocker. The men at the tail begin to say to themselves, now unspoken, again, Jesus is going to use his ability to perceive their thoughts or to recognize the murmur and the look in their eyes. And it's not said which. Um, who is this man who can even forgive sins? You might well see Luke 5, 21 through 24. But Jesus, looking at the woman, said to her, It is your faith that has saved you. Go in peace. Now, I want to talk a minute about the word faith. The word faith is the Greek word pistis or pistuo. Uh, pistis the noun, pistuo the verb. It is a New Testament word that goes back to an Old Testament context. In the Old Testament, man put his trust in God, God's character, God's actions, God's promises. And that act of taking God at his word was considered faith. If you remember in Romans 4, which goes back to the life of Abraham, it said Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now the account we're talking about is the promise that Abraham will have a son. Posterity. Now Abraham didn't, you know, it wasn't some great thing on his part. He just believed when God made a promise 
that you can depend on it. New Testament faith is not an act that man does. New Testament faith does not focus in on our sincerity, our enthusiasm, our commitment, our understanding. New Testament faith is our response to the trustworthiness of God. It is not how much faith we have, it's the object of our faith. Faith the size of a mustard seed will move mountains. It's the fact that we put faith in Jesus Christ that is biblically significant, not how much faith we have. Many Buddhists are sincerely enthusiastic, committed to their faith. It is not what we are that's the essence of faith. It's who God is and man taking God at his word and trusting in the trustworthiness of God. Now, in English, the word pistis can be translated three ways. Faith, trust, believe. Now, it focuses in primarily not on mental content, not on emotionalism, but on commitment to. Not an object, but a person. Faith in the New Testament is a volitional commitment to Jesus Christ that's followed by lifestyle fellowship. I think that's very important. Your faith has saved you. And the word saved here is perfect tense. Obviously, we're speaking of spiritual salvation because she was in no physical danger at this point. She wasn't sick except sin sick. And Jesus took care of that. Now he says, Shalom. Now it's a present imperative, which means it's a command. It's habitual, present tense. What he's saying is go and remain in peace. Now really it's shalom is the reflection here. Uh, sh shalom, like uh, the Hawaiian word, aloha, means both hello and goodbye. But shalom has the added idea of the presence of prosperity and peace as well as problems and sin. Um, so it's Jerusalem, shalom, peace. And I think that's reflection here. Now, I want to tell you, I think this action is so significant. When I, when I read this, I thought of that parable about the Pharisee and the sinner in the temple. The Pharisee lifting up his eyes and arms to heaven in the normal way of Jewish prayer says, Oh, Father, I'm thank you that I'm not like other men. And I thank you, Father, I'm like that, that jerk back over there, that, that sinner. I'm so glad I'm not like him. I thank you that I'm so righteous and, and, and acceptable to you. And the other guy in this parable was a poor, sinful man who came in the temple and he was so burdened down with his sense of, of sin that he has his head bowed and he's beating his chest in, in, in a, as a sign of repentance and contrition. You know, to tell you the truth, uh, I think that that parable is so good about contrasting attitudes of coming to God. But we've picked it up in the church as the, as the form of prayer. Everybody who prays like this is considered to be a Pentecostal. That's just the way everybody prayed in the New Testament, including the Jesus. Uh, I've often thought if we're going to pick up on bowing our head and closing our eyes as a form of prayer, if we're going to be biblical, we ought to beat our chest too. That's where we get it from is that parable. But notice the contrasting attitudes coming to God. One thought God owed him something because of his great works, and the other one knew God owed him nothing but beseech the character of God love. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly the way all of us come to God. I don't know if you think God owes you anything because you're so righteous and wonderful because you belong to a church and you try to keep moral standards and you give and you read your Bible and you pray and you don't do certain moral things and you don't say certain cuss words and you don't do certain dietary things or food things. But I want to say to you that we need to realize that nothing we do makes us right with God. The gospel is caught up in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now we need to hear that. We can't come to God telling him what a wonderful person we are and how much he ought to appreciate us being on his team. No, the first step in real maturity is a recognition of our spiritual bank. Ruptness. Matter of fact, I think the whole Sermon on the Mount, especially the Beatitudes, is showing us the need for a sense of spiritual bankruptcy. Those who hunger and thirst, those who mourn, on and on. We must come to the place, like this lady, like the sinner in that parable, where we recognize that all we have from God comes from God's grace for us and not our deserve or our merit. 
That's a very important spiritual principle. And I think those of us in the church get really caught up in our own goodness. Faith is recognizing the goodness, the loyalty, the worthwhileness of God's love for us, not who we are, what we do, how we act, how we feel. Be careful. Self-righteousness is the ongoing sin of the church. It's rampant in Jesus' day. It is rampant in our day. Which one reflects your attitude? Would you be willing for your love for God to do something so very socially inappropriate to show how much you love Him? Weeping publicly, coming to the altar to pray, helping someone, whatever. Would you be willing to abase yourself in front of your friends, people who knew you, take a stand in a humble way? Or are you always the one pointing your finger at the inappropriateness of others' actions? I've enjoyed being with you. I'll see you again, same time, same place, next week. God bless you.